welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Storytime with BDD. I'm your host, BDD, a.k.a. Brooklyn Dad. Folks, one of the biggest lies ever told is... Let me get this up on the screen here. Is... I hate to say I told you so. Really. I mean, really. Nobody hates to be right. Nobody. And especially, nobody hates the ability to say, you know what? I was right and you were wrong. I told you so. Um, I told you to bring a sweater. Or I told you we should have left earlier. Or I told you Joe Biden was going to win. Okay? We like to be right. But in the in the case of my guest today, um, I would say legitimately he did not want to be right, but he was. Um, he was one of the first and one of the loudest voices screaming from the top of Twitter Mountain, Holy Mother of God, in January of 2020 about the historic pandemic that was about to change millions of lives here in America and across the globe. He's not resting on his laurels, though. He is steadily keeping watch, ever vigilant uh, for the latest and greatest nasty, germy threats creeping up on us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, epidemiologist, health economist, and founder of the World Health Network, Eric Feigelding. <laughs> Doctor, thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, now, first things first, um, you have a very impressive resume, which we will get to in a minute. Uh, but what you and I have in common is the fact that you are a dad. Uh, in fact, we couldn't even do this interview earlier. We were, I originally wanted to do this earlier with you, um, but we couldn't do it because you had to take the kids to the dentist, as I recall. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Where you lost two teeth. So oh. you know, those, are, those are the days we're, we're trying to get through these days. So thanks for your flexibility. Oh, yeah, no problem. Now, let me ask you this. Does your medical experience kind of give your words extra weight, like with the kids? I mean, you, can you say like, hey, you better eat those veggies because, you know, if not, monkey pox. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first of all, I'm a med school dropout. I, I, my field is in epidemiology and separately in nutrition, but... That also gives me credibility to tell him, eat your veggies. But I think, you know, in certain ways, you know, just saying you need to eat your veggies is not enough, right? Because everyone knows they need to eat their veggies. Everyone knows they shouldn't smoke, but they still do it. So, like, trying to convince people to do it is actually, it's a science, but it's also more of an art. And it's a social science art, right? Mm -hmm. And that comes with knowing how to communicate to the public. And I feel like in this day and age, communicating to the public in a forceful way where people will listen and act to save their lives is actually more important than just the science alone. So I think this is why I think, you know, you and I became friends and I think it's so important to get the message out. Agreed. Agreed. And then very well said, actually. Um, now, let me, let me ask you, you came over here to America from Shanghai when you were five. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did your parents convince you or sway you, persuade you to get into medicine? Or did something happen in your childhood that um, made you say, you know what, I want to get into science and medicine and all that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the stereotype is that, oh, Asian parents made their kid become a scientist or a doctor. That's actually not what well, I was a kid who played a lot of video games, ran cross country, uh, and track in high school. But then, uh, uh, you know, something happened along the way in which I got diagnosed with a baseball sized tumor in my chest. Um, and uh, they had to do a major surgery to open my chest 
rib cage apart to get it out. Lost part of my lung, lost my thymus gland. Thymus is a T in T cells. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, I became you know, immunocompromised uh, as well as, you know, it changed the course of my life. So I didn't grow up wanting to be a doctor. That was never my mission. I want to be a fighter pilot. I want to be an astronaut. That's actually what I really wanted to do. But uh, life throws you a curveball. And, um, you know, I was just a normal 18-year-old who graduated uh, high school. But then everything changed and it lit a fire and set me on my path towards epidemiology and public health. Interesting. Interesting. Well, congratulations. You know, I, I think... Uh, um, there's quite a few people who respect what it is that you do and are grateful for what you do, not just, you know, in real life, but also on Twitter and on TV. The, the messaging that you promote uh, is very important, I think, to the overall well-being of our republic, you could say. Hopefully. Uh, now, you're, an also, you're not just a scientist. Right. You had a little bit of experience in politics. Uh, did you not a little while ago run for Congress uh, in Pennsylvania? Was it? Yeah. Uh, Pennsylvania is where I mostly grew up through elementary, middle, high school. And so in 2018, I, uh, I was like many people, very frustrated in Trump administration when science was basically completely thrown out the window. And I, you know, became a public health activist and advocate. And I decided to run where I grew up, um, the Pennsylvania 10th District, where it's currently represented by, um, pardon me, uh, Representative Scott Perry. Um, I didn't win, but uh, I think in certain ways, um, the activism and the messaging and the communicating with the public actually honed a lot of these skills that I think helped me to this day. And I think, I think it's really great that we have, we need to fight for representation, fight for what we need. And I think that kind of energy really translates, especially during COVID where every advocacy for people to mask, vaccinate and not spread the virus is critically important. Thank you for that answer. Now, let me ask you this as a follow up to that. Do you think all scientists should have to take a course in politics or communications, something like that? Well, I think um, all scientists who want to have a role in communicating should have some understanding of political nuance, but also how to when also to really, really lean into a message and how to better make the lay public understand. Like if you're working in a lab and we're lab scientists and you know, I think not everyone needs to understand the science, but if you're out there trying to tell people, I think there are really important advocacy lessons, whether you're advocating for gun control, whether you're advocating for um, you know, women's rights, uh, whether you're activating for, advocating for insulin prices, all those things, that same skills and advocacy translates when you're trying to communicate to tell people, hey, I believe this is a public health emergency that the world should pay attention to. I think that kind of skill and translation is never taught and rarely is it, are you able to pick it up on yourself? I picked it up through many years of running a lot of other uh, cancer campaigns, but if I hadn't had that decade and a half experience, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be actually as, as bold as I am on online because I know I think getting to the public and getting their ears to perk up is really key and a key, key part of saving lives. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now, now let me just, um, let me establish your bona fides, if I if I may, you because you are one smart cookie, in my opinion. Uh, epidemiologist and chief of COVID task force at the New England Complex Systems Institute. Uh, you were formerly a faculty member and researcher at the Harvard Medical School and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. 
uh, the chief health economist for Microclinic International and co-founder of the World Health Network. I did my my research and did my homework here. <laughs> now, despite all that, despite all of that, folks were quick to you an alarmist uh, when you first raised the alarm about COVID. It was you basically against everybody else. Um, what made you so certain that you were right and they were stupid? Well, I don't think other people are stupid, but I think advocating for what is like very likely, I was pretty darn sure it was going to happen, but advocate, putting your voice out there, I think it takes a certain level of um, courage and, and willing to buck the trends and willing to, you know, forego a career in academia, uh, given how many scientists, many scientists don't want to act unless they're absolutely sure about something. They want to be like, dot the I's, cross the T's, and be completely backed up with like a gazillion studies before they say, well, I think this does potentially cause cancer or something. That's how academics talk. And outside mm -hmm. of that, they have to talk in really vagaries where it just completely gets lost to the public. Um, you know, I've spent 15 years at Harvard. I, you know, it's not like I was had a short stint there. I know how academics work, but I know more about how to communicate to the bigger public. And I'm not gunning for any promotion or tenure or some sort of um, cozy, you know, policy job where I have to stay in line, not upset the status quo, not upset the business powers and corporate interests of that be. I think in certain ways, I had nothing to lose because I felt really adamant about this. The data was there. Um, I understood China better than most academics since I was born there. I speak the language and I have relatives there. Um, and so when all the basically the signals were going off and even China did not have any control of this. And all of my sources in China were saying that this is as bad as it can be, that China really has no control over this whatsoever. I think at that point, I was willing to basically, you know, jump the gun and pull the, the emergency switch. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, I was hated for like a month or two when everyone was still saying it's just a flu. But uh, I think, you know, I would have loved to have been wrong. If I had been wrong, you know, I, I would have faded mm -hmm. back into obscurity and that would have been fine because, you know, I spent all these years and I've never really did social media on Twitter whatsoever. And I have a, I actually have a 5 million person um, Facebook page that I manage, but I didn't even <sighs> use that. To, to warn the public. I really wanted to warn on Twitter where it has a lot of journalists, policymakers, mm -hmm. people who could actually pay attention beyond just the usual Facebook riffraff. And I think, you know, I had nothing to lose and I was absolutely certain that this was happening because I've seen this before. I pulled many whistleblower uh, emergency handles before, but uh, this was one of the ones where if you stay back, you're on the wrong side of history maybe try to deny what's inevitable is going to happen. Now it, it was, it was 50, 50. You could have been, you could have been right or you could have been wrong. I mean, granted you did see the data and you, as you said, you know, China um, better than a lot of people, but you know, uh, some people would have argued that the data was not conclusive and it was too early. I mean, it was January. This was like right at the beginning it was a bold thing, and I appreciate that you say uh, you would how you would have rather have been wrong because a million people died, you know. And if you if you were wrong, you know, a million U.S. Uh, people died. Over fifteen million people died worldwide. And worldwide, yeah, even, even higher, close to twenty million, according to uh, economists. So I think you know, I think the data, I think history will know which side of precautionary principle is right. Because precautionary principle is where, you know, let's, if you're not sure, you should err on the side of caution. 
And then if you're sure that it's all clear, then pull back. Yes, you mm -hmm. may inconvenience some people, but you would have saved a lot of lives, whether it's human to human transmission, which early on they said, well, you don't have evidence of that. Well, you don't have evidence against either. Airborne transmission, oh, you know, it's not airborne. Oh, it is very airborne. Oh, asymptomatic yeah. transmission. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't pass the virus unless you have symptoms. Hence, you don't need to wear a mask. Obviously, there is a lot of transmission. And of course, masks do work. And all these things, reinfections, now we, we know many of these things. But back then, it was horribly, horribly controversial somehow. But, but no one has taught the precautionary principle because precautionary principle is the inconvenience factor that, hey, I don't want to, don't inconvenience my brunch, don't inconvenience my birthday party. And, but, you know, we have literally millions of, tens of millions of lives on the line. Yeah. And people are sometimes very self-centered, unfortunately. And of course, that's part of the reason why the pandemic still continues to ravage, even if some people could try to claim that COVID is over. So I think the learning the precautionary principle that on when you're not certain, err on the side of caution would have saved millions of lives, millions of lives. But we don't have that philosophy. And we take the, you know, prove it. It's like climate change, right? Oh, climate change is not real. Climate change is not real. And all the hurricanes, all the weather and the droughts and there's rising sea levels are happening. And then people are like, oh, oh, maybe it's real. But then oftentimes it's too late for many people. I, I, I'm a firm believer in I'd rather be safe than be sorry. You know, like I, that's that's the, the dad in me. I have so many sayings just like that. My kids are tired of it. Um, now, we've gone through. By now, we've gone through more than half of the Greek alphabet in terms of these different versions, the iterations of the, we had the Delta and the Delta Plus and the Omicron. And what, what we, are we up to BA.5 now or something? Yeah, All right. We're, we're at, you know, we were originally Omicron, then BA.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now there's BA.2.75 as well in India that's growing. Um, you know, in certain ways, you know, BA1 and BA2 are more different than each other than Delta variant was from the original Wuhan strain. But we just stopped. Apparently, someone just gave up putting new Greek letters on it. And that's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. Because in certain ways, the letters also raise the level of consciousness. Because if you just give it another, you know, numerical number, it just becomes... A, a numerical forgettable number in the background but ba5 is so evasive like in the old days the virus strains that su succeeded the most were the fastest sprinters right but mm -hmm. now that a lot of people are vaccinated boosted and have previous infection the virus now selects for not the fastest sprinters but the best pole vaulters the pole vault over your existing immunity and that's what ba5 is it is the best pole vaulter you know, wow. even Biden got infected. Yeah, I always want Christ. people to think: if Biden gets infected, if the president of the United States gets infected, if Fauci gets infected, you know that it had already pole vaulted over many, many guardrails and fences um, of infectiousness to get to them. And uh, and boosters, you know, booster uptake is not as that great. And vaccines, you know, just the basic vaccines in kids. Let's just say, let this sink in. Among 12 to 17 year olds, only 60% um, of kids have even two shots. Um, among five to 11 year olds, only 30% have two shots. And mm -hmm. most of, and in terms of boosters among kids, it's even lower. And among adults, boosters are not that great. Um, even among the high risk group over 65, we're only at like 60% boosted in this country with even one booster. So I think we're in, a, we're in deep doo-doo because -doo. uh, Paxlovid, <laughs> the drug, it's hard to get into. I catalog, cataloged how hard it was for me to get it. Um, it's really hard to get access to Paxlovid. It's tedious. Um, not everyone can afford or has the healthcare resources to go jump through that many hoops to see doctors. And of course, there's a rebound. Now, Paxlovid will save your life, but is that really a strategy? Like, it's a whack-a-mole because it's, it's like you have a ship and you're plugging ships with Paxlovid so that they don't go to the hospital, but 
you know, the U.S., by the way, owes like billions of dollars in an IOU to Pfizer for all these Paxlovid. That's actually on loan because that's the first thing they said in the pandemic bill. First $2 billion of dollars of the um, $10 billion they asked for would have been to repay Pfizer for all the Paxlovid. So <laughs> we're actually wow. in a, quite a bit of doo-doo. And we, we're out of money for uh, more vaccines, for the adaptive vaccines. This is why we're begging for another $20 billion dollars. Which I don't know if, if that's going to happen or not. Look, I think the U.S. it's a very patchwork system, and um, in certain ways, the "let it spread" attitude. Oh, we have the tools to prevent you from going to the hospital. That's a very uh, that's really close-minded. Because I want you to think of it this way: say you have, say you, your body is like a four-lane bridge, highway bridge, right. and you're boosted. Assuming you're being boosted, if you're boosted, you close like two of the four lanes in terms of mm -hmm. infection, but you just half of the infect virus can still get through. But now you feel invulnerable because CDC tells you, oh, you don't need to a quarantine or anything like that. You can just go out after five days isol isolation. <laughs> you feel invulnerable. You're not going to go to hospital. So now you go to nightclubs, bars, all these parties, which great. You're enjoying your life. But you're actually putting more traffic across this bridge. And that, because it will actually spread more virus and cause more disease. Because if you had two scenarios, one, uh, more severe, but less contagious virus. Two, a more contagious, but le much less uh, severe virus. Which of these two viruses will kill more people? Let me tell you, it's the less severe, more contagious virus that spreads more. And I think that's that will kill that more people lost on people. But this is what's happening. You're oh, we say we've made the virus less severe, but we're just spreading it more than ever. And that's just going to be more variants. And we're just we're just asking for this pandemic to continue at this rate. All right. So, OK, when when does it end? Right. Because if we've we've reached a certain level where uh, X percent of people have been uh, vaccinated and boosted. So, you know, as many people as possible are, are vaccinated against this. Um, does this mean that we are perpetually living with this is endemic and it's not ever, ever going away? Well, the thing is endemic could, means two things. It could be a high endemic where the virus is constantly ravaging us or a low endemic where it's like in the background um, but rarely does it actually affect people. And right now we're living with this high endemic virus. And that is not something we want to live with because that's the Wait, attitude. Of high, high in, are, by high you, endemic, you mean a lot of people are dying still. Yeah, a lot of people are not just dying, but also hospitalized because hospitalizations are surging. Deaths aren't surging as quickly, but hospitalizations are surging. And then, of course, long COVID. Long COVID affects anywhere from... 20 to 30 percent of people who are infected uh it's even stronger if you're hospitalized but even if you're not hospitalized you're still affected let me just give you an example from one british study like 80,000 people in the uk took this iq test if you're on ventilator um and hospitalized on ventilator you lost seven iq points if you're hospitalized but not on ventilator you lost five iq points but even if you never got hospitalized you lost anywhere from one to four IQ points. And to, to put that in perspective, points? you know how like we don't accept lead drinking water, right? Flint, mm -hmm. lead poisoning. Well, lead poisoning for kids is like a negative two hit on your IQ. And, but somehow it's okay. No one accepts lead poisoning as okay. This is like, this is an apolitical issue, like lead poisoning, right? Right. But somehow we accept long COVID IQ poisoning from this COVID virus that's affecting us and making us, by the way, immunocompromised, which actually could be contributing to a lot of these other uh, uh, viruses that, uh, that were in phenomena that we're seeing. But it's making us immunocompromised. It's hurting the workforce. People can't work. Even the Federal Reserve warned that this is a, a clear and present danger. Even the UK uh, Treasury also warned that labor market is going to be hit so hard you know how we have like you know, worker shortages that's part of the shortages is is partly wages but also long covid 
And the Federal Reserve and the UK, UK Treasury both acknowledge this is like a huge, huge slam against our economy. Um, and not to mention mental health and, you know, and family care and whatnot. But this is going to be with us for many, many years. But it's, it's like one of those invisible things in the background, right? Because you don't see it today. But it's, it's going to be something that ravages our co communities, cause heart attacks and strokes for many years to come, even those without high risk factors. And that's well proven from Johns Hopkins studies. So we're really going to be a world of hurt with this. And those who just want to just let this virus rip, they're going to have blood on their hands. Now, let, let me ask you this. Should, should the task of messaging for things like COVID um, also include realistically managing people's expectations? Because, you know, Americans did not handle the mask and the vaccine situation well at all. They just flat out rebelled. They went to buildings and, um, you know, but with, with that said, originally my expectation from getting vaccinated. Look, when I was a kid, I remember getting vaxxed like a bunch of times when I was, you know, get the whatever the hell it was. They, they they jabbed me with needles about a dozen times or so. And what I knew is that I didn't get rubella or polio or any of those things. Boom. I, so in my brain growing up, when you get vaccinated, it means you can't get that Thing. And that's the problem. We, we, we're having a, a dichotomy here in the country where, you know, there's a, a percentage of the population that says, you know, it don't make no sense to get vaccinated. Look at President Biden. He got vaccinated. He got it twice. He got two times. It don't make no sense. They just put things in you and make magnetizing 5G. You know, people are not fully grasping. And I think part of the problem is messaging. I expected that, hey, if we get four shots, we should be good. I totally expected that. And I, you know, I'm fully vaxxed and boosted. There yeah. was a breakdown in somebody dropped the ball in communicating what you guys should expect. Hmm? Right. So first of all, like the coronavirus uh, is an RNA. An RNA virus is mutate a lot faster than DNA viruses. DNA viruses are much more stable. That's why... We store our genome in the DNA because it's, you know, prevents mutations uh, more uh, than the RNA. But the other key thing is like most of these things we vaccinate for, you know, they're pretty low level. Like we, I, we are hearing about polio right now and some measles outbreak, but they're still very, very low. And if everyone's vaccinated and you can keep them low, they're not going to cause that much problems. They're not going to mutate that much. But... Coronavirus, COVID right now, the SARS-2 coronavirus is in a different league. It is on a huge, huge billion person scale. It is infecting people two, three times a year sometimes. Um, it is mutating because it's RNA. It's mutating so much and it's pushing its way through uh, billions of people uh, each year. And that's just giving the virus so much room for practice. Like most mm. of these viruses, the polio, measles, it infects what a couple hundred or a thousand, a couple thousand people tops, right? In the US. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't have like this huge volume of practice. Think of like a gymnasium, you know, the gymnasium of people uh, and the number of people in this gymnasium for the virus to practice on is tiny for polio measles, and and most people are vaccinated. So it's not gonna it's gonna enough to keep it contained. But with the R SARS coronavirus. The, the, the vaccine works that we have works originally 95% efficacy against the Wuhan strain, but it's we've mutated so far from the original Wuhan strain. And the, in, it's a whack-a-mole because the more you let the virus spread, the more it's further going to mutate, right? It's, it's, it's a rat race. And if you let it spread more, it's going to mutate more. If you, again, you can tell people, hey, don't worry um, you know, you're not going to die. You're, you're, the chance you'll get hospitalized is low. You know, it's okay mm -hmm. if you get an infection. It's all right. But that just only allows the virus to speed up. Remember the, the bridge, you close two lanes of the bridge, but you're actually putting more traffic through the bridge. Now yeah. that's billions of, vi of virus infections will give it more practice. 
And that's why it's always staying a couple steps ahead of us, ahead of the vaccine. And until we have a, a adaptive vaccine and adaptive for the current variant, which I don't know how if, if we're going to be able to keep up with that, we no, need like it's gonna mute, keep mutating works across the board. But we're right now falling way behind because your two, three, four shots are still right now, as of right now, the Wuhan 1.0 strain from two, well over two years ago. And that's oh. that's really out of date. That's why we're so behind the curve. God damn. So, yeah, I just saw earlier today that there's like a fifth booster that they're talking about now that is going to go to the people who are, you know, the high risk uh, population. It, it so adapted to strain ones, yes. But yes. the issue is, is it going to be oftentimes, for example, flu shots, we try to predict which strain is going to be like the dominant strain six to nine months from now. And we build mm. our flu shots around there, right? But it's like a, it's, it's a hit and miss kind of thing. It could be another strain that takes over. And this thing right now with coronavirus, it's moving faster than the flu, mutating faster than flu right now. And this is why we're having just such a problem keeping up because by the time we've done all these adaptive vaccines, we're still testing these old December, January Omicron BA1 adaptive vaccines. And that's not enough against version five, BA5 or whatever comes next afterwards. Um. All right, Doc, I got a question from Punxsutawney Mo here. He's, he wants to know, how do you counter vax information when the idiots believe vaccine causes sterilization, disease, or death? How do you counter that well, misinformation? It's, it's pretty obvious that it doesn't because the data shows that it doesn't. Um, this is, you know, there are anecdotes and then there's epidemiology. And epidemiology which is what my doctorate is in, is literally the study of these epidemics and trends. So first of all, sterilization, we have already have lots of studies in pregnant women um, and women trying to get pregnant, no problems. They deliver babies just fine, no miscarriage rates that are on, out of normal. Um, everything is pretty normal. It doesn't cause sterilization. And that's been proven over and over again. It doesn't harm your sperm or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and for the death, th there are people who say, oh, look, you know, the more booster shots you have, the more deaths you have. But that's only true, again, in like this overall curve, not when you break it down by people. And this is where I'm trying to emphasize that you can't, you know, it's really easy to mislead people um, with these really, uh, look, oh, Rising shots, rising deaths, but it's also rising, you know, um, variants. And the shots are reducing deaths by, you know, 60 to 70 and 90 percent, depending if you have two shots or whether you have three or four shots. But, um, you know, like they turn a blind eye whenever we show them this data. It's like, oh, it, it's some fake data, right? It's like whenever someone shouts fake news. Well, right. this is... Uh, this is official data collected in multiple countries, multiple governments of the world's health departments. And it clearly shows that those who are not vaccinated or under vaccinated are those who are dying way more than those who are boosted and, um, and, and whatnot. So I think, you know, we, I can sh show data about preventing um, uh, deaths until the cows come home. But the problem is that the people who are, have the misinfo they live in this ecosystem, this bubble, right? Just like bubble. the echo, MAGA crowd yeah. live yeah. in this bubble where they think there's, you know, um, where the, where they think that right now, oh, FBI planted data. That's their new conspiracy. Or, you know, that the election was stolen, et cetera. It's an echo chamber. And I, and I agree, it's really hard to break the echo chamber. You need almost someone inside the chamber to just sit up and like, hey, Guys, that's not what the actual data from all these health departments around the world are showing. And that's not what all the scientists are saying. And that's not what their data is saying. But right now, it's, you know, you can, all, misinformation is way more viral than the accurate information. Because the accurate information is less sexy than some sensational misinformation. Um, yeah. 
and I think that's really, really hard to solve, especially all, all this anti-vax little bubble um, and how to break it. I think you're right. I think uh, they're going to need to um, they're going to need to reach community leaders, respected community leaders uh, that people trust, that those people in within that bubble can trust. Maybe somebody maybe somebody who was um, personally affected yeah, in one way, I, I you know, that's a family truth. member. Like, I think to myself about cigarette smoking, when do people everyone who smokes cigarette actually knows that cigarettes are bad for them. You know, most people know it's bad for them. But when do they quit? They quit only when someone they know or they love uh, gets lung cancer or gets well, some cancer and dies. I, and I then quit. Like, oh, I, quit I, should, almost, I should sober I, up. I want to see my grandkids someday. I don't want to die at age 50 or something. That's when they sober up. But until the, it hits them personally, it's not real. And the sad thing, by the way, for vaccines is I, even Trump said he's vaccinated and boosted, right? Remember that time? Um, yeah. And then he got booed by his own audience, which was I was oh, actually wow. shocked. Yeah, that's right. I, I actually Shit. clapped that he, uh, you know, that he told his audience he's boosted, but his audience completely rejected that. But of course, totally they go on that. to listen to his other nonsense. But, um, but that's really crazy when even they reject the fact that Trump told them he's vaccinated and boosted they they boo him and just filter that part out it, it it is a very powerful form of denial that likes of which yeah. i've never seen before we're doomed all right let me move on to uh, uh to this one here because you sent me this tweet and i didn't even realize that there was a rift there was a beef with the cdc um so basically you and many other twitter users and a lot of people across you know everywhere have an issue with the CDC's guidance on um, how to deal with testing. If somebody's recovered from COVID, uh, their their current guidance is f- here in the U.S. five days, and you don't have to five days you quarantine or whatever, and then you don't have to retest. And you have a problem with that. Tell me why. Yeah. So yesterday's CDC guidelines were really disappointing. A lot of epidemiologists and public health advocates had horrendous reaction to it. And basically it says, hey, if you're if you're uh, exposed to the virus, you're close contact, um, you don't need to quarantine, forget it. Um, you know, you, and you don't need to test but sometimes. Um, and, you know, we don't need to contact trace or anything. Uh, we just, you know, just let it go. They also dropped the six feet thing, um, and they dropped a whole slew of uh, things. And, and this is on top of you know dropping. They a lot. dropped the social distancing. Yeah, they dropped the six the official six feet rule. It's it's I That's know my favorite one. But like in, you know, in certain ways, like them dropping masks was also really bad. Um, but previously that happened previously. But just dropping all these mitigations, they're saying basically infection is. Nothing to worry about. But we know how many people um, got sick during the the January and December Omicron wave a couple months ago. That was, you know, the hospitalizations were pretty darn high. Deaths were, it's one of the, it was one of the deadliest waves uh, outside of the original spring wave um, mm-hmm. in the winter of, of 2020, 2021. But, you know, in certain ways, they feel like, Oh, the you know, COVID is over. This attitude is just it's just disgusting. And I wanted pe- people like to know if you're working inside the CDC and on COVID, how could you stand by this stuff? And and like you know, I'm sure there's some intellectual disagreements, but you have to speak out um, because it is just complete dereliction of any public health responsibility because CDC is the center for disease control and prevention, not the center for disease treatment and solve it later kind of thing. And Mm -hmm. prevention is the cornerstone. Like I always tell people, you know, you know, we don't have uh, helmet laws that say, you know what, today is a low ER (laughs) hospital bed plentiful day. You don't need to wear a helmet. 
Today, you don't need to buckle your seatbelt. We have plenty of beds and plenty of ER space. We don't, that's yeah. not public health. Oh, you know, drunk driving today is legal because look at the hospitals. We have plenty of beds. That's not right. any public health um, guideline whatsoever. We don't drop them just when, when you have lower, um, you know, hospital occupancy and ER occupancy. Yet that's what the CDC is doing. And by the way, CDC, you know, there's, they have two maps. One is for transmission. One is for hospitalization, which is they call it the community levels. And they keep pushing the hospitalization map because the transmission map is so bad. By the way, right now, hospitalizations are up. Deaths are up. Um, case, you know, cases are still really high. Um, but they say, oh, again, you know, unless it's hospitalizations, it doesn't matter. But whatever happened to long COVID, long COVID, most people who have long COVID are never hospitalized to begin with. And this right. is this is what's insane about this. We're literally um, screwing over our next generation. We are, you know, basically uh, telling our future generations and our current generation, you know, your long term illness and disability does not matter. If you're immunocompromised or have risk factors, your life doesn't matter because Every, the rest of us want to go brunch. The rest of us want to li live a um, pre-pandemic normal life. Um, you know, the hospitalizations and the long COVID be damned. And that's basically CDC's attitude. And I can't believe it because, you know, it's not like we're, they're doing this while, case, while cases and hospitalizations and deaths are low or dropping. They're doing this while hospitalizations are going up like this. Deaths are going up as well. And, and somehow what's, what's now the reasoning the time to release this? It's, it's insanity. What's the reasoning for them uh, changing this guy, like dropping those uh, those guardrails? Well, now they're saying basically, oh, we have to learn to live with COVID because that's what um, their statement was. Oh, COVID is here to stay. Well, if COVID is here to stay, then we need to fight it, uh, not to just lift up all uh, you know, mitigations and uh, guardrails against it, because it's not like we had some magic, you know, multivalence brand new vaccine that will stop all future variants. If they have something that stops all future variants, great. If they have a drug that is like pennies each that anyone can take uh, readily and don't have access issues, um, that's, you know, way easier than Paxlovid, great. Um you know, all these things, if we have cheap, free tests again, great. But we don't have any more money for more tests. So is, all is their this, rules. Is this the reason? Right here? Yeah. One of our viewers yeah, says the economy. the economy. But, of course, I don't know if we're, we can prove it. I would love to be a fly on the wall um, mm. and listen in on some of these phone calls and discussions of what the hell got, got into them to say some of these things and issue some of these guidelines. Um, and uh, I think that's the pollsters is the wrong way to do because, again, um, in the end, people, when their lives um, and their families are hurt, they're going to come for blood that, you know, uh, we basically abandon them. And I want to emphasize like high risk immunocompromised people. That includes anyone with diabetes, um, obesity, asthma many other heart cardiovascular disease, when you add them up, that's like 60, 70, 80% of all American adults have these high risk factors. And then the CDC just shrugs. Oh, if you have a high risk factor, consult your doctor. It, it, is, it is really, really insane and irresponsible. L let, me, uh, let me ask you about this new threat that we are facing, monkeypox. I mean, we weren't even done, you know, reeling from COVID. You know, we're in the process of going from pandemic to, I think you said high endemic or low endemic, whatever. But now here comes monkeypox. Why has a disease like monkeypox, uh, excuse me, monkeypox just popped up out of the blue? Yeah, this is a, this is a very worrisome thing. Monkeypox has been around for like, uh, since the 19, uh, mid 1950s. Um, but I think it's a combination of reasons. There's more encroachment of humans on animals. Um, um, fewer and fewer people have 
smallpox vaccine protection, but that's that's not a main factor because uh, most Americans are not vaccinated against smallpox. I think the, the newest data shows that there is mutations, like serious mutations in the monkeypox that the strain that's going around, there's actually two strains, I think, that are going around now is way more different than any monkeypox that we've seen before. And again, it's just a small hop, evolutionary hop and we get unlucky and the virus uh, super spreads around the world and um, here we go. And there's there's also discussions that, that we are potentially immunocompromised uh, from COVID because COVID, long COVID actually hurts uh, some of our T cells um, that basically our immune systems weaken uh, and hence making us more vulnerable. This is also part of the reason we we think we're seeing a lot of these liver, uh, pediatric liver cases as well. Um, altogether, I think it's really really worrisome, and I think monkeypox. There's also pandemic fatigue. You know, we at the World Health Network said monkeypox is a public health emergency and a pandemic emergency back in June. Um, WHO decided to punt the day after we declared. It's like, oh, it's not a public health emergency. A month later, they came back. Oh, it's a public health emergency. And of course, in August, at the beginning of this month, uh, the U.S. declared it's a public health emergency. But you know, we've been shouting at the rooftop that monkeypox is going to, people kept saying it's going to fizzle out. We've been shouting on the rooftop that it is not going away. It is a clear and present danger. And the early cases is not just some oh, unlucky uh, detection. We barely have scratched the surface. We've only begun to do a lot of testing. Most people still don't get readily um, monkeypox testing like they can with COVID. So it is just so, so worrisome that we're fighting this neglect, neglect right now, and blaséness. Uh, this indifference is actually what is causing the virus to spread even more. And of course, this misinformation that's only a gay disease. You know, Florida today there was uh, reports of um, that a woman was turned away. She said uh, uh, by the Florida Health Department that, oh, sorry, ma'am, heterosexual women can't get monkeypox. It's like that's what? not true. In Africa, forty mm. percent of of all cases this year are actually among women. Uh, it's not, it, this is not a gay disease whatsoever. This is uh, a, tra a disease that can transmit to anyone, and and we're just happen to be testing a lot of um, MSM men, um, even though you know the virus clearly goes beyond them. And I always want to emphasize this: that unlike COVID, where the elderly are the most severely affected. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, children were affected horrendously in, in, in the Omicron wave uh, of COVID. Monkeypox, it's more severe in kids under eight. So, yes, there hasn't been any U.S. deaths yet. There's been lots, uh, several European deaths. But if we let this spread and it spills over to kids, remember, once kid school starts in late August and early September, that's when we're going to see potentially uh, more and more kids spread. And this okay, is a speaking very of, stable speak virus that it stays on surfaces for a very long time. Speaking of kids, I have a question from Amanda Crawford who wants to know, what precautions can parents take to try to avoid having their kids catch monkeypox at school this fall? That's a very good question. Um, so monkeypox is primarily, you know, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, surface fluid transmission. There, but I want to emphasize there is a lot of uh, concern that it could be partially airborne. Um, it is definitely respiratory as well. And because um, a lot of CDC, old CDC documents and other UK documents all say airborne for monkeypox uh, and mm. or airborne precaution needed for monkeypox. And so I think the masking and the ventilation is still key. But I think also hand washing is is critical of course we've we've been talking about that a lot but that kids you know like kids touch stuff and lick yeah. their hands and pick their nose mm. and this this is this is something that's worrisome i think depending on what the transmission is like like if it has runaway transmission among adults it's going to spill over in kids then without a doubt the kids may not transmit as much um, because, you know, kids don't have 
as much sexual and fluid encounters as adults do, but yeah. it will spill over to kids and kids have a lot of snot encounters, right, at school. And mm -hmm. I think we haven't discussed gloves yet or anything like that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't pass, uh, put it past that we may need much more, you know, besides the face mask and ventilation and of course wiping down surfaces, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say uh, yes, but it could be that we may need potential gloves and other things if the spread gets out of control. Hopefully it won't get out of control among kids, but I'm extremely worried because right now we're in this August lull in which people yeah. are on vacation. They're not reporting things. They're not in school. They're not at work. But once things get you know ramped up again in the fall and especially September. in the winter, it's going to be bad. Yeah. Is the government underreacting, overreacting, or Goldilocks reacting? They're just right. <laughs> um, I made that up, TM. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure they are underreacting. Uh, I think uh, in certain ways, uh, they're now like reacting, but they're under-responding. Um, you know, for example, the, the Genios vaccine, monkeypox vaccine, they don't have any more until... October. So right now they're cutting the vaccine dose into one fifth and then giving it trans, you know, you know, via your skin dermally, intradermally. And I think that's a good step, but that's still not going to, you know, even if you multiply our current limited supply by five, it's not nearly enough to satisfy all the demand that we're seeing and vaccinating in a way that, you know, stops further spread. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Uh, because the bulk of all these millions of vaccine orders, I think we ordered over four or five million now. They're coming in Q4 and Q1 of next year. So, smallpox. Smallpox vaccine. No, the monkeypox vaccine. The, the ah. Genios. Um, we, we, the the Bavarian Nordic Genios uh, vaccine. We Most of it will come Q4 and Q1. And there is another vaccine called ACAM for smallpox. But... I don't want to use that vaccine because it's it's really difficult. It's you have to like prick your uh, your, your skin with uh, several times. Uh, it's not like a simple injection, and you have to come back to check if it worked or not a week later. And it and it has really severe side effects. Really severe side effects that you know it's going to give anti vaxxers way way too much ammo <laughs> because this is the yeah. vaccine that you know. Doctors try not to give unless it's for smallpox, right? Because again, the risk benefit, if it's smallpox, oh yeah, you need it because smallpox right. is so deadly. Um, yeah. By the way, smallpox has killed way over a billion people in the last um, couple hundred years. A wow. billion that with a B. Okay. Yeah. That's not an exaggeration. Smallpox is that deadly. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we, we eliminated it in the 1970s. But monkeypox is a cousin of smallpox, and and they say it's a milder cousin. But milder viruses are known to mutate, right? Common colds can mutate into into COVID, um, and this is where we have to be super super vigilant that we don't let it spread. And again, if we let it spread to millions of people, that's just gonna give it more time, legroom, runway to mutate more. And then we'll get into this whack-a-mole that we've been getting with COVID. With marriage. COVID. We'll, so we'll, we'll, we need to nip it in the bud, but that takes fast action. And right now we're just, we're barely doing any testing, contact tracing, and not enough vaccines and not enough treatments. It's just not enough of everything right now. Will the monkeypox vaccine prevent if you get vaccinated with the monkeypox vaccine, will it prevent you from getting it either, you know, through the air or through touch? Um, we don't know the precise efficacy because the nature of the monkeypox vaccine was they were approved based on, um, you know, very limited studies in Africa against the old strain, the original old strain. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for, for hospitalization and deaths, we actually um, actually don't have exact estimates of hospitalization and death prevention because that's actually from inferred from animal studies. So we don't actually have like the the trials 
of the same caliber that we have for COVID. But we know it works. But to what degree uh, against protection? We don't have the precise number. Uh, what degree protection against a new variant? We don't have a precise number. And what is it against transmission? We don't have uh, its precise number because previously in Africa, we have such low testing that you only find a lot of strong symptomatic cases. A lot of the milder cases completely go missing and uncaptured. Um, this is why we were, we're not 100% sure of the precise efficacy. We know it works. We know it works to like the 60, 70, 80% range. But against a new strain, um, it's, it's an open question how much. So we shouldn't rest on laurels of vaccine only. And I think that's always been my message during COVID. It's not just vaccine only. It needs to be vaccines plus. Plus prevention, multiple washing, layer. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's kind of like, think of rakes. You know, when you rake something, when you rake leaves, the rake doesn't get every piece of leaf. But if you rake two, three, four times, or you have consecutive things, uh, you're going to you're gonna get most of it. It's like a moat. A moat doesn't stop all invaders. But if you have a moat in a high wall, outer wall, inner wall, you know, uh, murder hole, oil, <laughs> boiling <laughs> oil. You can, you yeah. can stop the virus. Uh, you can, uh, again, so when you have multi, <laughs> multiple layers, it's like it's, some people call it the Swiss cheese. But we have to mm -hmm. take this multi-layer Swiss cheese approach instead of just relying on one fence. And for the most part, we've been relying on the one fence vaccine approach for way too long. Okay. Um, now on to polio, because life wasn't already dangerous enough in 2020. <laughs> Uh, reports have come in that polio has been seen in New York State uh, a long time ago, back in the black and white days. Uh, we have pretty much eradicated polio. I think, uh, wait, I think it was 1979. Uh, polio is an infectious disease, by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that spreads from person to person and it causes paralysis. And this picture back here, these are people in iron lungs because I guess they were so paralyzed they could hardly barely breathe they couldn't breathe um them. am i right yeah yeah this is very severe paralysis um so you know, now it's FDR back fdr was a was was paralyzed by polio when he was a kid mitch mcconnell yeah. by the way barely survived polio when he was a kid so in I certain ways that. he's actually a huge vaccine proponent but here's the thing why like, the hell is this back why is it back <sighs> Now, it, of all it, times, now, we have monkey pox, very, polio, COVID. We have sharp drop in vaccinations because in certain ways, the anti-vaxxer movement is spilling over from COVID into all anti-vax. And, you know, there's certain religious groups, I won't name them, that are anti-vax as well. Um, you know, there was a man of 20, in his 20s who got paralyzed in New York, in Rockland County. Um, and vaccines... You know, statewide in New York, for example, it's 79% um, um, among two-year-olds who have three shots, so required three shots by age two. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, in certain counties, it's like 60% or less. It's when, when you have that low, you're just asking for trouble, right? Um, and, and this is where this pandemic fatigue and the anti-vax movement collide, Right where we let our guards down. Oh, mm -hmm. this anti-vax of this leads to anti-vax of everything. Because actually in certain ways, I think it, I think I could be wrong. I think it's in Tennessee. They passed this law that um, basically um, stops kids from being, um, it makes it much harder for kids to be vaccinated um, against all diseases, not just COVID, uh, the coronavirus. I think this is where this, is one of the greatest, greatest problem eras that we're entering into. Because back then, people remember polio, remember their neighbors paralyzed, remember yeah. their neighbors dying. But today, we don't have any living memory for the most part, other than the really elderly generation over age 65 who remember, oh, yeah, I lost my neighbor. I lost my sister or brother to co-polio. You don't mm -hmm. want that. But a lot of people today have zero memory. And if they have no zero, uh, if they have no memory of something, it almost like it doesn't exist. Hell, people don't even remember, don't even know the Holocaust. And people today, you know, the education of young people 
it's just so devoid. And right now it's just spilling back. This anti-vaxxer movement is just growing so strongly. He has a question from my wife, uh, wants to know what can be done about the anti-vaccine movement? Yeah, this anti-vaccine movement is, you know, there is the, you know, uh, there's a saying, the vaccinated and mass shall inherit the earth. That's if we don't do anything, right? That's if we just, you know, come what may, but that will lead to a lot of innocent deaths because you know kids they don't understand vaccines um the the adults uh, if you have an irresponsible parent you know and they don't they get deluded by the anti-vax um movement then they actually hurt their own families and kids innocent kids are hurt but there's also a lot of misinfo and disinfo spread by you know also foreign adversaries where they have the schadenfreude attitude, you know, ha ha, let America burn. That's yeah. a lot. We know a lot of the anti-vax disinfo comes from Russia. Like, that's well I proven and documented that. yeah. in countless reports. Um, so I think fighting this disinfo campaign on social media is really, really critical. But again, if social media companies don't want to participate or be on the side of public health, you know, this you know, this free speech of any dangerous information is actually what will get a lot of people killed. Um, Because, you know, I remember, like, remember the saying, it's it's irresponsible, illegal to shout fire in a movie crowd, a movie theater, right? Yeah. It's irresponsible to shout anti-vax stuff in the middle of dual global or public health emergency and pandemics and rising polio. Um, I think... There ought, there ought to be a law, you know the saying? But yeah. I think right now a lot of politicians are scared of their constituents. They're, they're, they're buying into a lot of the anti-vax. You know, in certain ways, when I look at how many politicians buy into the January 6th conspiracy of, you know, stolen elections, I, I sometimes have to ask myself, you know, if politicians are even buying into this, this January 6th, um, and stolen an election conspiracy, um, then what? What is what hope is there for fighting vaccine disinfo? Yeah. Um, well, the diff- is there's a difference. It's a difference. The 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 stolen election thing is a political expediency thing. They have figured out that they cannot win a primary unless they embrace the big lie. Um, right. The anti the anti vaccine thing is different, though. It's very different, and I'm just concerned. It's different, but it's the same kind of audience. Yeah, uh, there's a huge overlap. It's not that. But they're Democrats. They're Democrats. There are there who are, are some anti vaxxers too. Democrats Crazy. who are anti vax too. But for the most part, the anti vax <sighs> movement is strongest in the the far right crowd. Uh, it is stronger there. And I agree that there's like a double phenomenon. There's the crunchy people who live in Marin, Marin County, um, just above San Francisco, who are anti-vax, right? That, that's mm-hmm. a different kind of anti-vax than that, the, oh, you know, vaccines will, will kill your children uh, kind of misinfo um, that's being spread on the far right. But it, it, it's bad on both sides. But I think it's it's worse on the other side where, you know, you have the ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, right? All that kind of um, misinfo, disinfo that people said, oh, don't take the vaccine, take ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. That side has a much more louder echo chamber. Again, breaking this echo chamber needs uh, someone on the inside to, to break it. Um, or we break the, the structures that allowed these echo chambers to form in the first place. Um, mm-hmm. And short of mandatory vaccinations, um, and I think which, by the way, it does, mandatory vaccinations do turn people off. But I think instead of using a stick, we should use carrots. That if you have more vaccinations, uh, uh, you incentivize. Can, you can you can encourage. We, by the way, we have all these vaccination rules for public schools already, anyways. Right? It's just now a lot of people saying, "Well, then I'm going to homeschool." Which is their right, <laughs> so but it, it, yeah. but the virus just keeps spreading and spreading, and 
And at some point right now, we still have enough people who are polio vaccinated overall, adults for the most part, and, um, and most kids. But if this movement grows to a critical mass and mm -hmm. hits a tipping point where less than 60, less than 50% of the people are vaccinated, oh, we're in deep doo-doo. We're in deep trouble because then, you know, it's it, the virus will hit a cr critical crescendo to keep growing, growing, growing and mutating, mutating. And right now, unless we have that under control, it will get out of control. But this is why it's in public health. It's both a science and an art of communicating. Right. And it's a policy political uh, discussion. And unless unless you understand the politics and the policies um, and how to communicate around them and fight the disinformation, you as a lone scientist are, I would say most scientists are completely ignorant of how to, how to fight this. You know, I used to, uh, I, I, I used to think that, you know what, Darwin will take care of those knuckleheads. But the problem, the problem with that is that those anti-vaxxers are also going to infect the immunocompromised, the people who, you know, for no fault of their own, they, they can't get, a <clears throat> excuse me, they can't get the vaccine or they're more um, vulnerable to uh, being infected. And, yeah. you know, they, yeah. this, this, uh, this public right now is selfish. They don't give a shit about the next guy like they used to. Back, I, I feel like back in the day, you, people used to care more about their fellow man than they do now. Yeah. And that's sad. But um, I am now, we are now up to the part of the show, which is my favorite part of the show. It is the guessing game part of the show. And they explained this to you a little bit beforehand, but I didn't tell you what the categories are. And basically what this is, is I'm going to give you a choice of three categories. Um, uh, and there are questions that you will, you should be able to answer. Uh, this first one is unjumble that jumbled name. These are politicians, the names of politicians, well-known politicians, but their names are all scrambled up. Um, name that Billy Joel song. Billy Joel is a very oh popular, famous singer. Um, and in this one, I would sing some of the lyrics of his songs and you would have to guess which song it is. And number three probably the easiest one or difficult most difficult one depending on um how you're feeling today this is name that infectious disease and in this one i'm show pictures of the disease molecules and you would have to identify which disease that is which all one right to pick? I, this I'll play the first game, the the politician name. The first point. one. You sure you don't want to go with the infection? No, I want to I mean... do. I want to do political. I want to anagram Ted Cruz's <laughs> name out. Come on. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, uh, this one is. Um, you, you you're not feeling it today? Has it been that I that feel long like, since you uh, finished school? Today is a very political news heavy day and um I feel that's more that's that's going to be more fun for me. Okay, there it is. I, I don't want to be doctor uh, doom pandemic doom all the time. Come on. <laughs> okay. So, uh in this one here, if you answer correctly, then I will strike the cowbell. If you answer incorrectly, you get the uh, family feud wrong answer. Okay? All right. You ready? Ready. Here's the first one. Oh. Da, na, 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 na. I don't know. Go ahead. I, it, I hear you saying something. It's this. 
No, it like doesn't make sense. Is it all one? Two, is is the first name anagrammed and second name also anagrammed separately? Correct. Correct. Oh, I don't know. That first name got me. All it's right. Like, well, we were looking oh, for Stacy Abrams. Abrams. <laughs> oh. Oh God! I why I my brain is stuck on like Republican members of Congress somehow. Oh no, there's a mix of Republican and Democrat in this one. All right, oh. I got faith in you though. I got faith in you. All this right, one was right. just Let's, your warm up. Okay, you ready for the next one? Here's the next one. Oh my God! And by the way, um, folks were guessing. They were guessing along um, with you. So. I Here's know, the next one. They probably got it way before I did. <sighs> Here's the next one. Vin. <sighs> Man, I'm really bad at these. What could that first name, that five letter name, be? <laughs> the audience has already figured. The I, audience is going to be so disappointed <laughs> in me right now. Oh, what? What am I? What am I missing in these? It's like, a five letter. Kyvy, Nike, Nike. Kevin, oh, Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> I got it. Yeah, Kevin McCarthy. You should have made job. one of these Good falsy, job. by the way, just so you know, for fairness. <laughs> if I put that, if I put that uh, small C, it'd be too easy for you to guess. Okay, fine. All right, here's the next one. You ready? Yes. Uh, da -da. Jamie No Jamie Raskin <laughs> Yeah There we go There you go You're on a you're on a little roll here Well Better done roll, yeah. Well done Here's the next one. Oh, this X. Um. Oh, man. Boom, boom. Zemina, I don't know. What's her last name? Oh. Well, it's interesting that she pointed out the X. Yeah. Think of think of what name could have an X in it. Mix Max. Maxine Waters. <laughs> Oh, that took a while. Good job. Good job. Look at you redeeming yourself. You're on a roll, I'm coming back. Friend. I haven't done anagrams in like 20 years. You're doing very well. Very well. And just so you know, I don't know if you realize this, but you, you see that it's actually the picture blurred out. Right. Now I, I've, I've now figured it out that it's a woman based on the orange outfit. Uh -huh. Or a okay. very fabulous, you know, politician. Nail politician. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Oh, we got some people saying uh, you should have gone with Billy Joel. I personally, I'm oh, disappointed ouch. that I. I that don't I know Billy Joel. Like I, I, you know, we if you've done Brian Adams or or Aerosmith, I would have chosen that. Seriously, you don't know any Billy Joel? I'm not okay. I didn't grow up on Billy Joel as much. Okay. I could tell you, I could sing with you Celine Dion songs and Mariah Carey songs, 
and boys to men songs and boys to men backstreet boys songs but you just pick the wrong genre and artist next time next time i'm gonna uh cue up some r&b for you all right okay here's the next one amy klobuchar come on oh there you go that was too easy I didn't even get to do the, the tune there. Okay, here's the next one. John Ossoff. Come on. Oh! <laughs> Three letter first names, it, it makes it easier, you know? Okay, all right. Here's the next one, uh, Mr. Uh, Show Off now, Mr. Smarty Pants. What do you got here? Adam Kinzinger. Oh! <laughs> See, Republican members of Congress, I, I, I have them nailed. Okay, okay, you are definitely on a roll now. I think you you whiffed on the first one or two, and every every other one you've guessed correctly. What about this one here? Not so um, easy. King Jeffrey. Oh, wait. Yeah, King Jeffrey, <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Come on. Very good. Very good. You're definitely on a roll. What's this one here? Um, Nikki Haley. Wow. So Come on. <laughs> Wait, I think. The double K gives it away. Uh, okay. Beto O'Rourke. Come on. <laughs> now you make it too easy. Come on. I think. Wait, is that the last one? Yeah, that was the last one. Oh, so, well, you should have well like done. saved Stacey Abrams for last. <laughs> well done. Now, now we're on to my favorite things, and what this is is basically um, a way for the audience to get to know you, the things you like, the things, uh, yeah, just the things you like. So there are no wrong answers in this one. Um. You ready? This is rapid fire. Ready. By the way. Rapid Let's fire. Go. Okay. Favorite TV doctor. Um. Uh, Doogie Howser. Oh, ah, good, good one. Favorite cartoon growing up. Um, the Batman cartoons. Nice. Favorite medical instrument. Uh, uh, forceps. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a lot of di anatomy dissection. I don't want to do anatomy tools. Okay. Favorite TV show to binge watch? Oh, back in the day, House of Cards. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're on the politics thing now all of a sudden. All right. Favorite thing to be right about? Um, the pronunciation of random Massachusetts towns like Haverhill <laughs> <laughs> or Worcester. 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 That was what I thought of when you said that. Okay. Favorite crazy long disease name oh god there's there's so many uh, uh you know what there's no favorite disease this is <laughs> no one but of those the name the, the the long ass name one that you you're like oh shit now i can say that um the, I forget what's the full name of the tuberculin the tuberculosis. It's slipping my brain. Um, let's let's pass on that right now. <laughs> but I don't. The thing is, I don't want to be a Doctor Doom, and I. This is where you know I don't have a favorite virus. Okay, so I don't want to. It, it's not a favorite topic of mine. We we got one here. Somebody Claudia saying, <laughs> "Is that real?" I don't know. I actually don't know that one. Shistosomysis. And then we have another one here. 
Pneumonoclampata volcano <laughs> microscopic tramp. No, that's not real. That's funny. There's pneumocystis okay. pneumonia, but I there's there's a lot of these <laughs> lung diseases as well. But uh, I, let's, curse I, let's let's avoid. I thought we're doing fun favorite fun stuff. Not not viruses is not my favorite fun stuff. <laughs> Says the epidemiologist. Okay. No, it's not fun. I I'd rather t I'd rather t <laughs> tell you about how to you know trans fat is bad for you. Favorite <laughs> curse word. Oh, um, oh God, damn! <laughs> there, you just started one. <laughs> <laughs> This is come on, you're putting me on a weird space. I'm getting canceled for a certain comment. No, you can you can drop f bombs here. I, if, I just if I you just like. drop goddamn. Okay, it's it's. I feel like it's a very emphatic, and it gets my passion across effectively without saying worse stuff. Uh, okay, I would have gone with fuckery <laughs> or jackassery. Um, favorite Twitter account? Oh, uh, no, I can't. Can I say Brooklyn Dad Defiant? No. It was some some other one. Some other one. Uh, I would say AOC's Twitter account is one of the most entertaining and educational and inspiring. She's always viral. Always viral. Escalator or stairs? Um, stairs. Interesting. Why? Calories. I'm the exact calories. opposite. Come on. Well, unless you have a luggage, I, like, you know, on airports, sometimes people go up the escalator, but if I'm just carrying a backpack, I, I always take the stairs. Really? My knees disagree with that answer. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, there's no wrong answers here. Just so you know, no wrong answers. Uh, soda or water? Um... Considering that I've been drinking Diet Coke the whole time we've been talking, <laughs> I'm going to say Diet Coke, but not sugary sweetened be beverages. Okay, okay. That counts. Oh. Um, chocolate ice cream or vanilla? You can only choose between those two. I would say dark fudge chocolate. Dark chocolate. Fudge chocolate. Chocolate. Then why you got to make it so complicated, bro? <laughs> Well, it's got to be high cocoa flavonoid <laughs> chocolate. I, I used to be a chocolate scientist too, you know. Interesting. There's many layers to you, my friend. Most used app on your phone. Most used app. Um, besides Twitter, uh, the, on some days, my Tesla app. I'm I'm, like, I'm always watching how much charge is going into my battery interesting and before this... you tell to say anything aoc drives a tesla too okay just <laughs> putting it out there tesla is green aoc drives tesla it's okay how how does that car uh how does it how's it ride is it good it's it's pretty good it's pretty good i've i've been saving like 300 to 500 dollars a month on gas so wow yeah Wow, interesting. Tesla tells you that you put the current gas prices and it tells you how much you've saved. It's, oh, it's that's incredible. cool. That is very cool. Okay. I just wish uh, their um, CEO wasn't such a, a dickhead. Yeah. <clears throat> they if have you great could engineers. Yeah. If you could live anywhere, anywhere on earth, where would that be? If I could live anywhere on earth, where would that be? Mm hmm. I would want to live, I think, in Greece somewhere, like on mm. Santorini. That would be a beautiful, beautiful place to live. Except never Santorini is technically a desert. Um, it's, it's really hard to get to. But in terms of retirement or paradise, I think Santorini is, is just absolutely beautiful. I've never been there before, but I've seen it in the movies and it looks gorgeous, especially the water. So I'm going to take your word for that and add that to my bucket list. Uh, if you could do any job for one day, what would that be? 
any job, anything. For one day and one day only, yeah. mm-hmm. I would, I think I would be, a, I would like to be the CDC director and clean house for one day, mm. for one day. But for my personal enjoyment, I would like to be a fighter pilot for one day. Or astronaut. <laughs> That's for my personal enjoyment. <laughs> but for my personal responsibility to the world, I would like to be CD or C director and and clean up some stuff there. But I will but allow I would, it. I would love to be, you know, an astronaut otherwise. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Astronaut. Um are there any particular charities or foundations slash organizations that are close to your heart or that you support? Um, I really like American Cancer Society and I really like American Heart Association. Um, both do okay. research, both do advocacy, and both provide a lot of care, especially American Cancer Society uh, that provides a lot of care for um, patients who need treatment or need that extra family support. Um, there's a lot of cancer charities, but I think American Cancer Society is one of the best. And puts out public health guidelines and does research and funds research and conducts research themselves. It's an all around great organization, unlike many other, you know, dubious cancer charities out there. So yeah. I, think I highly recommend people always donate to American Cancer Society or American Heart Association. Thank you for that answer. And Dr. Eric Feigelding, thank you so much for being on story time with BDD today. Uh, this was an, indeed an honor to have you here uh, and to get your, your input and your feedback on the way things are and the way things should be. Um, do you feel hopeful about where, where we're headed? I mean, is there, is there any reason for our audience to be hopeful or are we going to forever just be stuck in where we are now? Yeah, I am actually a very positive person. I'm not a doomer, as many people claim I am. I'm just a very precautionary. And I think um, where we're heading is we're in this chaotic, you know, war in in which we're fighting for precaution against precaution. And in many ways, when people wake up that this is really, really bad, only then will we truly act. And right now we're in this, people have been lulled into complacency. And mm-hmm. being lulled in complacency is actually a worse place to be because then the virus has like free range to do whatever it wants. And we're also fatigued. And that's why monkeypox is, is really ravaging and anti-vax movement obviously is growing. But I'm hopeful that humans will come around, political leadership will come around and um, and that uh, unfortunately it may, there may be a very high price, but hopefully we will get to the other side and we'll learn a huge historical lesson of what everything, what not to do for next time. And hopefully our collective internet history memory, you know how they say the internet remembers everything except yeah. before the internet, right? So hopefully <laughs> that we have a collective memory of everything we, not, we don't, we shouldn't be doing that moving forward, we will get better to a better place and be able to fight through all this disinfo and misinfo. So I have hope. I really do have hope, but it might just be a couple more years before we get through, get through these trying times of, you know, whenever they say, may we live in interesting times. Yes. Yeah, we're here. Um, and I think we will get through it. It just will be a bumpy road before then. So until then, thanks for fighting. Uh, Doc, thank you. Thank you very much. And just do me a favor. um, While I sign off here, just just hang out. Don't go anywhere. Uh, I'll be back with you after I I sign off here. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining me for another wonderful episode of Storytime with BDD. I'm your host, BDD, a.k.a. Brooklyn Dad. And if you have not yet gotten your shot, What are you waiting for? Get that shot. Get that booster. Don't wait to find out that you should have done. And because then I'll be there like, 
I told you so. <laughs> um, and wear a mask. Keep your social distance six feet or better, no one, no matter what the CDC tells you. And have a wonderful evening and a fantastic weekend. I love you all, and I will see you again really soon. Peace. <laughs>